am. Um, good evening, everyone. I am, this is Dorothy Stoltz, Director for Community Engagement, Carroll County Public Library. And I am struggling here for a moment to get my PowerPoint up. And let's see, let's see. Um, do I have uh, permission to do so, Amber? Uh, yes, you should. Mm -hmm. Let's try it again. Yeah, it's not working. Uh, I'll try one more time. And let's try it. Thank you all for your patience as we learn. Here we go. Yay. There, that worked. Okay. So welcome to uh, an online introduction to We the People, America's Founding Visions. And this is sponsored by the Carroll County Public Library in Maryland. And it's supported by a grant through the Gilder Lehrman Institute for American History and the American Library Association. Uh, I had wanted to mention that there is a uh, national project called Revisiting the Founding Era. And uh, if you're interested, you can go to their website, foundingera.org, and uh, that's posted in the, the Q&A. So again, I'm Dorothy Stoltz with the library, and I'd like to thank Amber Farron and Daryl Robertson and Joelle Jarvis, uh, also from the library, helping us uh, kind of behind the scenes and to help monitor the program this evening. So at the very bottom of this screen, you'll notice something called a Learning Advantage Partnership. And our schools and our public library have a, really a fantastic collaboration. We also have an initiative called Celebrating America which was originally um, spearheaded through the county commissioner's office and various education organizations and uh, organizations interested in history uh, kind of pull our resources together and promote programs like this one this evening. Now, due to the health pandemic, uh, we're offering this program online and it's really just a little flavor of the full program that we had hoped to provide in two of our library branches um, and then also uh, a school field trip. And those were scheduled in March, uh, just a few days after the library and the school schools closed. So uh, this is our first attempt to offer this content, um, which I think you're gonna uh, really enjoy. And it's gonna focus on America's founding visions as exemplified uh, by some local historical figures. So I'd like to do just a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, please use the Q&A to type in your questions. We will hold those questions uh, until after the presentation. The presentation will be about 30 minutes long. Uh, just a reminder, we are live streaming to YouTube and after the program, uh, the recording will be posted to Facebook. I'll send out a handout or email a handout uh, tomorrow uh, related to the content that the panelists uh, so uh, kindly put together for us. And uh, I wanna encourage you to look for the full program, We the People, that we will be offering sometime later this year. So um, I'd like to uh, just introduce, um, I'm very honored and, and uh, pleased to have Judge Joe Getty as, who has been our lead uh, scholar for this project and he will be tonight's um, moderator and he's with the Maryland Court of Appeals. Our panelists include um, uh, historians in their own right, 
uh, Dr. David Greenspoon from Gerstel Academy, Sam Riley, the president of Union Mills Homestead Foundation, and uh, Jack Tillman, who is a museum educator with the Maryland Historical Society. So I am going to uh, turn the mic over to Joe and the screen share as well. Well, thank you, Dorothy. And we welcome all of our participants uh, this evening. Uh, as Dorothy said, we had planned to do this as an in-person program, and we hope you will join us sometime this fall when we're able to schedule it as an in-person uh, program. Uh, but tonight is a teaser. We're going to tell you a little bit about four people who were leaders uh, during the founding era. And uh, we welcome you to our presentation, We the People, America's Founding Visions. We are working uh, based upon a book uh, put out by the Gilder Lehrman Institute for American History, which Dorothy mentioned is one of the uh, grants uh, that sponsors this program. In 2018, they did a book called Revisiting the Founding Era. And the book includes letters and essays from the period 1760 to 1810 that explore the personal feelings and thoughts in this critical period of American history where our country declared independence and established a new form of government, a representative democracy. The selected writings in this book demonstrate that there was much controversy during the period in deciding to declare independence and forming a new government. And this led to many emotional differences in our community conversations and debates. To provide just a brief context for this evening, we'll be talking about uh, some people who were involved with the um, uh, founding era in Carroll County. And Carroll County was not founded until 1837. And so uh, we were formed from the westernmost portion of Baltimore County and the easternmost portion of, uh, of Frederick County. And I have a map from uh, Dennis Griffith's map of 1784, 1794 in Carroll County. Um, this sort of shows where Carroll County was. You see a pink dividing line going up the center of the screen between Frederick County and Baltimore County. That is uh, basically Pars Ridge a geographical feature that runs from Mount Airy through Westminster to Manchester. And this is the area in 1794, you can see uh, most of what's identified on the map are economic centers where there were mills uh, or churches. And uh, the area that began developing around the 1730s pretty much was scattered farmsteads uh, in 1760. It's not until the 1790s that you begin to get uh, communities developing after the revolution because of the prosperity of the Baltimore Harbor. In this area, as an e agrarian economy, provided lots of goods from the farms uh, to the Port of Baltimore for shipping and trade. So it's in the 1790s when you get uh, the development of the major towns. Uh, Tawny Town in Westminster, Manchester was a major uh, uh, trading community, and you begin to have the establishment of commercial activity, tradesmen in the towns, uh, and that sort of leads us to the final decade in the founding era. Um, by that time, Carroll County encompasses a very strong agrarian economy, prosperous enough to support craftsmen in the small towns, scattered along the turnpike roads. So with that, what we've done is we've decided to take four personalities of the era and give you an idea of some of their thoughts and some of their writings during the founding era. And um, with this backdrop, I'm going to turn to Sam Riley to tell us about uh, David Shriver Sr. Thank you. So, David Shriver Sr. was a, a leader in what is the area that is now Carroll County in uh, the Revolutionary War era. He lived from 1735 
1826, which is a pretty long-lived, long-lived person for that era, almost 90 years, or just over 90 years of age. And uh, he was a first-generation American. His parents were German immigrants. So he grew up without much and was really a, uh, a self-made man, self-taught, um, was a farmer, a miller, and a tanner. And, you know, with this, this humble background, it, his, he was very much uh, self-taught, not just in the kind of major skills of the day, but in language in particular. So when you read his letters, you can very much see that he uh, wrote and broke, uh, spoke and wrote in a uh, in broken English. Uh, so his, he and his wife had a farm west of Westminster, um, just between Westminster and New Windsor, and uh, was very active in the Revolutionary War effort and pushing for independence, and so much so that he actually was encouraged by his family and friends to be careful that there was a, a price on his head by the, uh, by the British. Um, he served in various extra legal committees that were serving the, trying to uh, uh, push the independence effort prior to the, uh, set prior to 1776 and to push non-importation of uh, British goods and so forth. And then in 1776, served on Maryland's constitutional convention, which uh, wrote our first form of government here in Maryland, um, and then went on to serve in the, in the legislature, both in the House of Delegates and in the, in the State Senate over a period spanning almost 35 years. And when he died, he was uh, eulogized as a sage of the revolution. Um, Dorothy, if you could put up my, my first slide. Um, his, probably the most important thing about David Shriver's identity was his, his, um, uh, his German background. And the first slide that you're seeing here is actually not his gravestone, it's his father's gravestone. But it's interesting to see uh, you know, the fact that it's uh, you know, inscribed in German and uh, uh, this is a graystone just west of, in a cemetery just west of, uh, just east of Littlestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, and when David Shriver died in 1826, he actually had two, two preachers, one in English and one in German, because that was uh, his, you know, English and German were kind of both very important parts of his life. Uh, Dorothy, if you could go on to the next slide. Um, I, this is just to give you some sense of what it was like to be German speaking in the 1700s. Uh, Germans were very much not the, uh, uh, a very uh, favored uh, uh, group of people. In fact, most of the English speakers looked down on them. Um, this is a letter from Benjamin Franklin uh, in the 1750s describing his thoughts about uh, Germans. And, you know, it's, you can read the, the text there, but it just, you know, Kind of interesting to see that language. You know, those who come hither are generally the most ignorant and stupid sort of their own nation. Um, and he goes on to talk about how important it was to um, uh, you know, the language barrier was such a significant problem in communicating with the Germans who were kind of set in their ways and uh, were difficult to uh, influence. So, uh, Dorothy, if you could, the next slide. Um, and yet, Having come from this humble background and being a German speaker and, and being known as an ignorant Dutchman when he got to Annapolis, David Shriver did pretty well and was one of the representatives from the middle district of Frederick, which would be essentially the uh, core of what became Carroll County and uh, uh, the area between Frederick and, and Westminster. So he served in 1776 on this uh, constitutional convention and did pretty well and served in politics over a long period of time, had a judge who became, our son who became a judge in Frederick. Two of his sons went on to found the Union Mills Homestead, which became a successful industrial enterprise of its own. And uh, one of those sons went on to then survey what was become the, uh, and the serve as the superintendent construction for the National Road. So that's kind of my uh, um, overview of the, uh, of his biographical background. And so I'll turn it back over to you, uh, uh, Joe, thank you. Thank you, Sam. We'll next turn to Jack. Uh, Jack, many people are aware of Francis Scott Key and his role in uh, the Star Spangled Banner, but give us a broader view of Francis Scott Key's background and experience. 
Yeah, thank you, Joseph. So unlike David Shriver, of course, uh, Francis Scott Key was not involved in the Revolutionary War. He wasn't even born until August 1st, 1779, right in the middle of the war. But his father, of course, was. He was a member of the Frederick Light Dragoons. He served three different spells in the, in the army during the Revolutionary War, although there's no um, primary sources that back this up. Sort of the family lore says that um, John Ross Key was at Yorktown serving under Lafayette. Whether or not that's, that's true is, is very much up for debate. But as I said, his father was a, a, a staunch patriot, while his uncle, uh, Philip Barton Key, who was sort of Francis Scott Key's mentor later in life in his um, law profession, was a loyalist. He had been sent to England, as was the custom with many um, upper class families in Maryland and all across the colonies at the time to be educated. And when the war broke out, he joined a regiment of the Maryland Loyalists. And after the war, he had to go um, back to England, although he eventually made his way back to the United States and he thrived here. He was the twice the mayor of Annapolis and he served three terms in the United States House of Representatives. So oftentimes we talk about divisions in politics and especially here in Maryland. And there were many families that were divided that had perhaps one son fighting for the Patriots and another son fighting for the Loyalists. So as I said, Key himself was born in 1779 at the family farm Terra Rubra, which had been founded, uh, purchased, excuse me, by Key, Francis Scott Key's great grandfather, Philip Key, who came over from London in 1720. So it had been in the family about 70 years at the time that Francis Scott Key was born. And he spent much of his, his early life in, in Frederick. As I said, his father was John Ross Key and his mother was Anne Phoebe Charlton. And here we can actually see a portrait of Francis Scott Key from our collection at the Maryland Historical Society. Um, in our War of 1812 gallery, we have a little display about the Star Spangled Banner and this portrait hangs right by it. And I do of course, urge everybody to please come visit us when we are able to, to finally open after the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And he grew up very close with his sister. And it was to her that he wrote one of his first poems. So he is sort of a, uh, gonna dabble in poetry throughout his life. And of course, in 1814, he's gonna write, you know, arguably the most famous poem ever written by by an American, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. In 1779, aged just 10, he was sent away to boarding school in Annapolis. So, you know, if we have any younger um, attendees tonight, it sounds crazy to send somebody so young away to school, but that was the custom at the time. He attended St. John's College, which had just absorbed the King William School, which of course was named for King William III of, of England. And he graduated in 1796. And a few years later, he met his wife, Mary Taylor Lloyd, who was the daughter of one of the richest landowners and slave owners in the state of Maryland. And that's going to play a, a big role in, in Key's life. His role with slavery is something that we'll discuss a little bit later. He um, married Lloyd in Annapolis in 1802, and then they lived briefly in Frederick before he moved to Georgetown. So Georgetown at the time was a little bit more withdrawn from, from Washington, D.C., but he um, lived there for many years and sort of managed his uncle, Philip Barton Key's law practice while he was practicing in, in Congress. Of course, in 1813, 14, Key is going to play an important role in the War of 1812, but we'll discuss that a little bit later. And he would go on to live until um, 1843, actually. So moving way past the, the sort of founding period. But during the founding period, he, he does play a role in some, sort of the politics between the, the Federalists and the and Thomas Jefferson and, and his, his disciples, uh, James Madison and, and James Monroe and, 
if any of our attendees have seen the play Hamilton, of course, they probably remember the character of Aaron Burr, who, of course, we're not going to say that that uh, play was by any means historically accurate, but Burr, of course, did exist. And he was actually involved in a sort of a conspiracy where he was accused of rallying people in the Ohio Valley to sort of form a, an empire and then declare war on Mexico or even the United States itself. And it's in defense of a couple of people um, who were sort of caught up in this conspiracy that he makes a name for himself in 1807 when he argues his first case in front of the su Supreme Court with, of course, the Chief Justice being John Marshall and Key is successful. And a few years later, he represents the Ohio Senator John Smith and he is successful again when they try to expel him from the Senate and his law career was very successful and later on he would serve as the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia under Andrew Jackson and his successors Van Buren, Harrison before he's finally dismissed in 1841 by John Tyler. So he lived a long life and we'll get a little bit more into the War of 1812 and some controversies surrounding him as, as we move along. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Key was a very prominent uh, attorney and uh, many people aren't aware of his accomplishments there. Uh, we'll next turn to David, uh, one of the revolutionary families out of the Revolutionary War uh, that's very famous is the Gist family. And one of the Gists, Joshua, lived in Westminster. Tell us about him. So my focus is Colonel Joshua Gist, who was actually born in Baltimore County in 1747 but moved to Westminster in 1772, where he lives uh, to well over 90. I think he was 92 when he died. Uh, this westward move into, Carroll, into what is now Carroll County came with the marriage to his wife, Sarah Harvey, um, where he took up land purchased by his father and his brother. During the American Revolution, he served as an officer in the Soldiers Delight, uh, Soldiers Delight Battalion as a colonel. He began the war as a first major, but got promoted to uh, Colonel. Uh, his unit was responsible, it remained in Maryland through the war, and it was responsible for putting down potential loyalist resistance. And it also um, played an important role in uh, training soldiers and drilling them and preparing them for combat. He qu acquired considerable land following the war, not just in Maryland, but in Ohio and Kentucky and Virginia. Um, and he acquired this land through his military service and through inheritance. And indeed, by the early 1790s, he had become a well-to-do farmer and um, owner of enslaved people, living on an estate which is now which is now known as, which is now on Gist Road. He remained a politically influential local figure through his long life, um, which extends long before, after the American Revolution is over. He was elected to the Maryland Assembly, and in his later later years, he was a key figure for uh, lobbying for the creation of Carroll County out of it, which was finally established in early 1837 out of portions of Baltimore and Frederick County. His pivotal role in the establishment of Carroll County is highlighted when he was tasked with the honor of ceremonially um, laying the cornerstone for the Carroll County Courthouse. And it was further marked by the high attendance of mourners from neighboring towns who buried him with, merit, with um, military honors. As a local uh, military and political leader in what is now Carroll County, whose role in this area has spanned over 60 years, he stands as a key figure uh, to focus on for this for panel. Thank you. Very good. I uh, also have a uh, personality I'd like to talk about, um, Samuel DeWeese who ended his career in Manchester, uh, but started, uh, he was born in 1760, right at the beginning of uh, our founding era uh, in Berks County, uh, Pennsylvania. And he, had, he has, adds a different perspective to our panel today because um, he was born in poverty. He was uneducated. Uh, he never became well-to-do like uh, our other uh, figures. Um, but in 1844, he wrote a, a book. He entered into an agreement with John Hannah Smith to do a book that would include his reminiscences. And much of what we know about him is from 
this biography that's interspersed with things that he wrote, as well as uh, John Smith Hanna's uh, patriotic uh, recounting of the Revolutionary War. At the beginning of the book is a uh, portrait of uh, uh, Colonel Deweese, Captain Deweese. And so this is uh, Samuel Deweese when he lived in Manchester uh, in the 1840s. And he tells uh, a number of stories in his book. The first one being uh, what it was like to be uh, in a family of poverty. His father uh, was a leather craftsman who actually was working as a collier at Patton's Furnace near Reading, Berks County. Samuel was one of seven children and at age five, he was an indentured servant to a neighboring farm family to do farm chores. And he recounts that he was treated cruelly and beaten as uh, an indentured farmhand. Uh, pretty much from age five to age 15. At age 15, his father was the local recruiter for Revolutionary War uh, enlistments. And he enlisted his son at age 15. And his son became a fifer and actually had a distinguished military career uh, over several campaigns playing the fife uh, in the martial unit uh, for the military. During the Revolutionary War, he witnessed and later documented many moving scenes uh, during his time of service. Uh, for example, he was present at the execution of Major Andre, a British spy, and notes that he played on his fife with the drummer, the Death March, on the occasion. After the war, he was elected captain of a volunteer company in Berks County. He also served uh, with that company in 1794 in an expedition to uh, quell the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. And during the War of 1812, when he lived in Manchester, he was too old to uh, be brought up in the military, but he volunteered for the defense of Baltimore when it was being attacked by the British. He served with the Ma Manchester militia at the Battle of North Point which repelled the British from uh, taking over the city of Baltimore. Obviously, he was in the trenches that night when Francis Scott Key was on the ship in the Baltimore Harbor writing his poem. He died in his 86th year of age on August 6, 1846 in Manchester. A local newspaper in Westminster printed a uh, 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 obituary similar to David Shriver's saying another Revolutionary War patriot gone. And it stated, he was ever ready at the call of his country. And he took peculiar pride in celebrating the anniversary of American independence. On the last 4th of July, he attended the celebration at Manchester on horseback. And few thought from his appearance that it would be his last celebration but he has now gone and will no longer stand among his friends and neighbors as a relic of the revolution. He will be long remembered for his strict integrity and many excellent qualities. So from there, I'd like to uh, uh, go round robin again with our panel and talk about uh, how their uh, personality, the personality of their figure uh, represents some of the uh, themes of the founding era. Uh, the Gilder Lehrman Institute book notes that like Americans today, the founding generation confronted many thorny issues, the balance of power between the branches of government, the relative power of local government versus state government versus federal government, the qualifications for full citizenship, the uh, qualifications to vote for suffrage, the tensions between law and order and the right to protest, the impact, the impact of taxation policies and the interpretation of the constitution. So Jack, uh, why don't you give us some thoughts about Francis Scott Key's leadership in the community in wrestling with the thorny issues of the founding era? Thank you, Joseph. Well. Um, Key, of course, is going to be sort of at the forefront 
of society for, for much of his life, often discussing many of these sort of uh, thorny issues that, that you discussed. And in sort of the handout that I hope most of our um, attendees were able to see, there's a letter from Francis Scott Key to his um, good friend, John Randolph of Roanoke, where Key says, I, I agree with you that the state of society is radically vicious. So obviously now we, we talk often about how divided our country is. Well, back then it was very much the, the same case. And that is there that the remedy should be applied. Put down the party spirit, stop the corruption, corruption at elections, et cetera. So Key, of course, was a, a Federalist, but he didn't have a problem working for presidents from a different point of view. He was also very much opposed to the War of 1812, yet he did a lot of work very closely with James Madison. He served on the Yazoo Land Claims Commission in Georgia and Mississippi under, under Madison. Now, in that same letter, he also touches on something called the Lancaster Schools. Now, this might be a, a term that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but he was actually one of the biggest early advocates for public education here in, in this country. So these Lancaster Schools started in, in England in 1803, and in 1810, Key starts to raise funds with some of his um, close associates to lay the grounds for a uh, Lancaster school in Georgetown. And it's going to open up in November, 1811. And Key would serve as a trustee and as a volunteer even at the school for the rest of his, his life. And, and this school charged people $8 per, per year but if they weren't unable to pay it, they were still admitted anyway. So that was really a revolutionary, um, especially in this country, idea that Key had that, that a lot of people probably aren't aware of. Now, the next topic is, that I just want to touch on very briefly here is Key and, and slavery. Now, like many of the founding fathers from George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and, and James Madison and, and James Monroe and even Charles Carroll of Carrollton, of course, the man who Carroll County is, is named after. These are all people who would um, preach that all men are created equal, but yet they all owned, owned slaves. And Key was no different. He, you know, he, unfortunately, he doesn't have a sparkling record on, on slavery, but he was, of course, a leader in the community when it came to that topic, whether it was for good or for bad. So he was one of the members of the American Colonization Society. And he is a speaker along with such people as, as Henry Clay, the great compromiser at the, the first ever meeting. In, and he's gonna spend much of his life recruiting new members and spreading these ideas of the Colonization Society, which for people that don't know, was, a, you know, especially looking back on it today is quite a, a controversial topic, but it was an idea of sending um, African Americans to Africa to live in in Liberia, and he was was a, a big supporter of of this idea. Now, um, slavery was also obviously a part of his life as a lawyer. Um, believe it or not, he actually represented um, slaves on a few different occasions. So, in one case in particular, on May fourteenth, eighteen thirty, he represented a slave named Harry Quando who had been freed by his um, owner's will. And the executors of the will sort of refused to acknowledge this, the, his, the man's freedom. And Key fought for him and got the, uh, and actually won the case. However, on, on other occasions, he um, represented slave owners. So he has a very mixed history when it, when it comes to slavery. And I think that's one of the things that makes Key so fascinating is um, is how he sort of contradicts himself various times. He, he owned slaves and he actually freed four of them during his life, but he kept others. So um, like many other founders, uh, important people in our, in our history, he doesn't have a sparkling record on, on, on slavery, but he was certainly at the forefront of society when it came to discussing these issues.
David, we'll turn to you next. Um, you mentioned that Joshua Gist was uh, instrumental, one of the leaders in uh, getting Carroll County founded. Uh, what other leadership roles did he play in the community? Sure. So Joshua Gist um, fits nicely within the theme of dissent and national security, um, forging how Carroll County would handle dissent. Um, the anthology that was addressed at the cornerstone of this project talks about how the Republic was considered, like the future of the Republic was considered fragile and uncertain. And leaders in society were trying to find a balance between dissent and national stability. To what extent could uh, Americans protest their governments? The anthology that we've been using looks, for instance, at the Alien and Sedition Acts of the Adams administration and highlights how Americans were testing the extent to which the government, in this case, the Adams administration, could stifle dissent and limit citizenship in the name of national stability, while other Americans, including Thomas Jefferson and those who drafted the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, uh, were in opposition um, and defended the rights of protest more and the rights of states to ignore federal law that they believe was unconstitutional in this sort of bogus idea that states could review laws and judge whether they're constitutional, uh, the spirit of 98. Testing the extent to which uh, citizens could resist their government. And although Gist, coming back to our Carroll County focus, was a Patriot Revolutionary War veteran, after the revolution concluded, he defended the stability of the nascent nation, putting down a, a quasi-violent uprising, which I'll talk about more, I think, a little bit later tonight, which to some people, this protest would have been seen as revitalizing the spirit of the American Revolution. Leaders like Thomas Jefferson may have seen what happened to protests as positive. Who had, you know, Jefferson had said that the tree of liberty must on occasion be watered by the blood of patriots and of tyrants. But for Gist and many others, these semi-violent protests um, would be viewed as mobocracy and the antithesis of a healthy republic. A lot of most, many leaders of the early republic wanted a representative government out of you know, memories of the fear of having to answer to follow far away to a faraway capital. But they were also concerned that this could descend into mob rule. And I think that's what Gist is doing in his uh, putting down uh, protests in 1794, which I'll talk about a little bit later tonight. That's very good. Sam, you've written a lot about David Shriver, who was very much a participant in the debates of the time over political controversies. What would you like to share with us? So I see, when you look through those Gilder Lehrman materials and they identify the various themes that uh, kind of come from a study of the revolutionary era, um, the theme, the two themes that jump out with David Shriver and that speak to his leadership. Um, the first is uh, the, the theme of nation and state making. And of course, in 1776, David Shriver put himself out, served in elected office to, or served in this convention to write our first constitution here in Maryland, which established our first declaration of rights and form of government. So it, just in terms of his service in 1776 in an elected capacity from the Frederick County area, he served in setting up our, our first uh, state government and, and how we would be governed, which um, you know seemed like it might be kind of revolutionary, but uh, when we get into uh, kind of the third round here, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but the second theme, which was um, a, a critical part of David Shriver's uh, kind of service, his, his leadership was, this idea of the transition, the theme being the transition 
from one party to the other. And, and most folks don't realize that you know, when from 1776 until 1800, essentially our country was governed by the same group of people, the same, there weren't political parties at the beginning, but they were the same sort of uh, uh, well-heeled individuals who um, wrote the, our founding documents and controlled the country um, on through the, the uh, election of 1800. And that election was a very uh, toughly uh, hard fought election. And uh, it was the first peacetime transfer of power in our country's history, which was so important. And right here in Frederick County, it was a, a very hard fought election. Um, the Frederick County Republicans uh, uh, complained that the Federalists wanted to overturn our present form of government and build a monarchy in its ruins. And that's how they looked at the, 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 uh, the, the Federalists. And, and the Federalists um, were criticized, uh, the, the Federalists rather criticized the Republicans a little bit earlier in, in, before they were actually political parties, but um, this is kind of uh, a good example of the language. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, talking about the opposition that existed back in 1776, uh, said that these were men of desperate fortunes and of desperate and wicked designs that are endeavoring under the cloak of protecting great privileges for the people to introduce a leveling scheme by which these evil men are short of profit. So you get some sense as to some of the, the kind of built-in tensions at the outset, and those played out during the election of 1800, which of course the uh, Jeffersonians, the De Democratic Republicans, which was what the party was called, um, many called them just Republicans for short, but that's the election in which we had this first peacetime uh, transfer of power. And that actually was echoed right down here in the elections in, in uh, 1800, 1801, 1802, 1803, where David Shriver was elected to the House of Delegates to serve from Frederick County. And um, I'll talk about some of these, these issues a little bit more in the next round. Very good. And to conclude uh, sort of our illustration of uh, local themes, um, I mentioned earlier with regard to Samuel DeWeese that uh, uh, he was sort of a man on the street. He lived a hard scrap of life. Uh, he did write these reminiscences, but they aren't flowery. They aren't a lot of patriotic language. Um, he actually, uh, um, uh, it, on the title page, uh, talks about um, it, it, it's his experiences. And what his experiences were, um, in, in many regards, um, uh, were, were very different from, from modern society. Uh, he did not have an upper uh, middle class upbringing. Uh, he served in the military uh, with enlisted personnel. Uh, and he describes many uh, deprivations from the military. Being at Valley Forge in the winter uh, without proper clothing and food. The intensity of emotions in military life when he describes uh, a firing squad uh, for deserters or a duel between two soldiers who had personal differences and, and took it out uh, with a duel. Uh, and of course, what I mentioned earlier, the public hanging of uh, Major Andre, which he provides a, a, a very detailed account uh, of the public hanging. Another uh, sort of touching account that he has uh, that, that uh, represents the harsh life uh, is when he talk, talks about a smallpox outbreak in the military in the fall of 1777. He was in the military. His father was a recruiter. His father was now assigned uh, in charge of a field hospital to take care of diseased soldiers. And some of the soldiers were exposing themselves to the smallpox in order to be inoculated. And Samuel Deweese's father exposed his son, at that time 16 years old, uh, to the pox um, so that he would be inoculated. And Deweese describes how sick he was. Uh, he, he felt uh, suffered much. His sister was called from a neighboring farm to care for him. Um, and, and about the time he recovers under his sister's care, their father uh, becomes ill 
perhaps not with smallpox, he says, maybe a pleurisy or a fever. And they go to take care of their father and within three or four days he dies. And the sister goes back to the farm um, and gets some type of illness. Deweese is not sure what. And uh, within three months, she also dies. So he gives a real sense of the hardship in this emotional counting of smallpox on the troops and how the illnesses affected his own family uh, in a time period where obviously medical knowledge was uh, very limited. Um, we'll conclude uh, with another uh, round robin uh, where we'll talk about uh, maybe one story with regard to your figure that you think helps to illustrate uh, the times of the founding era. And for this, we'll start with David and Joshua Gist. Sure, thanks, Joe. Um, if you look at the title of this presentation, its subtitle is America's Founding Visions, plural. And I think this, the episode I want to highlight about Joshua Gist highlights the competing visions that existed for the, what, how, how the revolutionary spirit should persevere after you know, the Peace of Paris 1783, after the American Revolution is, is over. A group of men, nicknamed the Whiskey Boys, publicly hoisted a liberty pole in Westminster, Maryland in July of 1794. Now, liberty poles and liberty trees had a long-standing history of being symbols of liberty. Before the revolution, they, were, they had been hoisted throughout in the United States in protest of the Stamp Act in 1765 and the Townshend Act of 1767. It's all, the, the symbol of the Liberty Tree goes back much further than that. The first Liberty Tree was um, after Julius Caesar was assassinated. His conspirators raised a pole with the cap that was traditionally worn by a freed slave. And that's sort of understood to be the first Liberty uh, Pole or Liberty Tree. Um, one historian, Arthur Schlesinger Sr., noted that nothing has dramatized the popular um, opposition to centralized power so effectively as liberty trees and liberty poles. And after the revolution ends, elements of the protest leading up to the revolution and the revolution of itself that were considered more radical, more leaning towards mob rule, were in many ways silenced and erased by elites uh, in the United States, including the spirit and of, of liberty trees and liberty poles. And this, we see this in what happens in Westminster in 1794, over a decade after peace had been reached with, with England. The actions of the Whiskey Boys in Westminster was part of a broader movement by Western farmers, most famously in Pennsylvania, but also in Virginia and Maryland. It was over a tax on whiskey imposed by the Federalist Coalition, the coalition that included George Washington and John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. Farmers had financially benefited from taking the grain that they grew and distilling it into spirits before shipment and sale. And so they were pro, this you know, was their livelihood. And so they were protesting this unpopular tax on spirit. The, pro, the uprising in Westminster was put down by Joshua Gist, who then commanded the 20th Maryland militia. He was fetched to put down the protest. Gist orders the Liberty Pole cut down into pieces, and the protesters absconded without any further incident. Although adversaries in this brief episode, both Colonel Joshua Gist a veteran of the American Revolution, who was likely in his mind reliving the experience as he brandished his sword and flushed the whiskey boys out, maintaining order in the newly forged Republic, as well as the whiskey boys themselves, who thought to use this liberty pole, this, this, this symbol of rebellion with a very long storied history, must have both sides must have seen themselves as perpetuating the spirit of the war for independence. Both sides were testing the balance between free expression and a stable nation in this brief episode. 
a balance that we still debate to this very day. What is appropriate pro? Everyone says the vast majority of Americans would say, you know, we have the right to protest. You have the right to free expression. But what exactly the limits are of free expression and protest is still a hotly debated topic um, in America today. Moreover, they were contesting what the American Revolution means. And today is still like the memory of the American Revolution and what principles the American Revolution were fought over continues to be you know, heavily debated. And the consequences are high. It means like, what is this republic about? That, that's a fascinating story of uh, the Liberty Pole in Westminster. We can only imagine uh, the emotions that were going on in the community. Uh, Sam, do you have a particular story you'd like to tell about David Shriver Sr.? Uh, yes, and, and I'd like to thank David for introducing what I've basically my topic uh, so well, because those competing visions are a, a nest or, or feed right into the, the story, which is, it's difficult, I guess, to have one story as much as it's a, uh, uh, a takeaway from two elections. Um, and, and I think it's particularly illustrative of who David Shriver was. And I should note that um, I'm lucky enough to be sitting in David Shriver's kitchen today, um, which is, um, and this is the second house in which that David, that David Shriver built on the property that he founded back in 17, or he, he started farming in 1760. But um, the, the house is, it's a brick house. It's a, I, I guess from modern standards, it's a nice house, but it's a Pennsylvania farmhouse. And when you look at it in comparison to uh, the other members that served in 1776 in Maryland's conventions, um, it's a in stark contrast because if you look at the likes of William Packa and Charles Carroll of Carrollton and on down the list, they were extremely wealthy. And um, uh, probably the, the, the significant takeaway from the, the 1776 is actually not the, the, uh, the fact that they wrote our first constitution, but that when they had, they had an election to decide who would serve as members of that convention, um, the, the requirements to be a member of that convention were the same exact requirements to vote that existed before the revolution, or rather before, seven, uh, before July 4th, 1776. And, and they included property qualifications. You had to have a certain amount of land and you had to have a certain amount of money. And the folks in Frederick County didn't particularly like that. And when they held their first election, um, the first election after July 4th, 1776, they, they literally walked into the, the, the voting precincts and, and then announced that anybody could vote. Um, if you could carry a, a weapon, you could vote. And that's what happened. And they had this election. And uh, of course, the, the powers that be in Annapolis, the, the likes of you know, Charles Carroll and William Packett and some of these other um, uh, large um, wealthy landowners did not like it at all. And the first thing that Samuel Chase did in 1776 was to um, have a motion to annul the election. So the very first election held in Frederick County after July 4th, 1776 was annulled because they, the, the folks didn't follow the property qualifications. And of course they went back to the, the, the voting precincts, voted again, and the exact same people got elected anyway. Um, with with a few minor exceptions. So that's kind of the takeaway from the first, and I should actually note that that Charles Carroll of Carrollton and, and, and PACA didn't get elected in that first uh, election from Anne Arundel County. Um, they had to um, basically come up with uh, an exception to get them into that convention from Annapolis. So um, that's 1776. And, and I guess I should note that that in that convention, all these very powerful conservative forces, um, that sounds sinister, but you know, the, the folks who had the money and had the, the, the uh, large amounts of property, um, they controlled that convention. And Maryland's convention, uh, Maryland's constitution, 1776, was a very conservative document. Um, and uh, there, was, there was an opposition. There was, there were, uh, there was a, a very vocal group of people that opposed uh, on, on, on several issues. Some of the funny takeaways were, things like restricting attorney's fees. Lawyers were not uh, viewed very fondly. And uh, so one of the, the things, the, the radicals is what they essentially were called. Um, you know, they, they wanted to lower property qualifications to vote. They wanted to um, get you know, tax lawyers essentially. And uh, anyway, so that's 1776. And then you can fast forward to 1800 when there's this election um, that where the 
Jeffersonians were seeking to, take, to wrest power using the, uh, populism themes, basically saying, we're going to lower, get rid of property qualifications. We're going to make it easy to vote. We're in favor of the farmers, good, plain uh, uh, Dutch farmers, uh, German farmers. You know, that's who we wanted to represent. That's who we wanted to encourage to go to the, the to vote. And that's what happened in 1800 here in Frederick County, Carroll County now. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm going to fast forward just a little bit to, to the election of 1803, which is one of the elections where David Shriver was elected to the House of Delegates. And it was very hotly contested. One of his opponents was Roger Brooke Tawney, who was Francis Scott Key's brother-in-law um, and um, was a Federalist. And uh, it was a very hard fought election. And uh, there were a lot of nasty things said about each other. And instead of talking about some of the, the, the nastiness, which is kind of funny, you look at elections today and you almost think that's nothing compared to back then. But um, one of the things they did was they, they, they favored having these big barbecues. And David Shriver had his sons, um, Andrew Shriver, who was very well educated as compared to his father, and his other son, um, uh, Abraham, who had a law practice in Frederick, they collaborated in writing all kinds of handbills in both German and English, and they had a lot of good barbecues. And so Abraham Shriver wrote to his brother, Andrew, over at Union Mills. He said, uh, um, you need to um, be vigilant, determined, and alert in your efforts on this barbecue. You will need at least 10 shoats and 10 lambs besides other necessaries of smaller moment. And then he said, above all, make use of nothing but whiskey. So this was a very large barbecue. Over a thousand people showed up at this barbecue in Union Mills, um, just north of the Union Mills homestead. And um, a, uh, uh, the Shrivers, of course, their job was to translate all the, the, the speeches into to German so that the uh, local plain Dutch farmers knew for whom they should vote. And of course, they voted accordingly. And David Shriver beat Roger Perktoni and served in the House of Delegates. So, and, but the larger point being that there was this major transfer of power and David Shriver, who was in the opposition and, and had no power in 1776, by the turn of the uh, 19th century, uh, David Shriver had quite a bit of power here in the area and was able to um, affect public policy as he saw fit. Different visions, um, all ultimately focused on winning elections and getting power. Quite an election story. And Jack, you've already previewed to us uh, what you'd like to use as your concluding story. Yeah, well, I thought about um, going down the road of Key's involvement in elections um, later on when he is a supporter of, of Jackson in the 1820s and 30s. But of course, I really couldn't stray from the story of um, Francis Scott Key in the, in the War of 1812. This, uh, this poem that, or was it a song? Was it a poem? A lot of sort of debate amongst historians about a lot of things that happened um, that night. But before we get to that, just a little bit of background because obviously the, the national anthem has been in the news quite a bit lately, especially with, with the NFL and, and the Colin Kaepernick um, controversy, kneeling and everything. And I think it's very important that we look back and, and you know, what was going on in the war at the time, what were Key's views on, on the situation, and of course, what was he, he doing um, when he was witnessing the bombardment of, of Fort McHenry is another question that some people might not be 100% clear on. So the War of 1812, of course, begins in 1812, but the, the fighting in earnest doesn't really come to the shores of the Chesapeake until until 1814, although the, the British fleet had sort of been harrying our, our shores and, and the, the trade here in the, in the Chesapeake Bay region. But in 1814, um, in April 1814, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, the emperor of the French, um, abdicates. And the British are now able to turn their attention to this um, side theater of war. And they're able to send some of these elite troops that had been fighting the French on the, the Iberian Peninsula and the Peninsular War over here. And some of them are going to be fighting right, right near, I'm, I'm living in, I live in downtown Baltimore, right in Locust Point near Fort McHenry. So of course this story is, is very special to me and um, very fun to relive. So key, as we mentioned earlier, and as Sam mentioned, his brother-in-law, Chief Justice uh, Tawney, 
They were Federalists and he was very much opposed to the war in the beginning. But then as he sees the British um, harrying the coast and, and making these raids, he actually joins the, um, the, the uniformed militia um, in 1813 for nine days. And he quickly realized, you know what, this soldiering thing is, is probably, probably not for me. But nine months later, he rejoins as a quartermaster this time. He had been in an artillery unit uh, previously. So in a little more of a cushy position, I guess, but he still doesn't last too long, but he is present at the Battle of Bladensburg on August 24th, 1814, which is um, nothing short of an absolute disaster, a catastrophe for the, the American troops. Um, only about 500 were regulars. Everybody else were, were militia. And we were fighting against British troops who had been bloodied on, on the, the peninsula fighting under, under Wellington against some of Napoleon's best marshals. And it was a route the Americans ran and the British took Washington. And it's of course the only time that Washington has ever been been taken in its in its history it was obviously not taken during the the Civil War, and the British um, burned the president's house. Of course, we all know the tale of Dolly Madison saving the portrait of George Washington, and and obviously many other documents. And they burned many public buildings, although they saved most personal um, private property. Um, and shortly after this, the the sack of Washington, the burning of of the president's house. Some British uh, troops are sort of renegade troops are causing some mayhem in the countryside. And a young, and not a young man, excuse me, an, an older gentleman by the name of Dr. William Beans um, gets together sort of a, a local militia and he locks up some of these British troops. And one of them escapes and he comes back with a, a company of soldiers and they take Beans and two others prisoner. And it is Francis Scott Key who was given the task to go negotiate um, their release. And that is why he finds himself in the, the position that he does. So he sets out to go find um, the British fleet. HMS Tonnant was um, Admiral Cochrane's flagship. And he wrote to his mother on September 2nd and he said, I don't have really any idea where the fleet is. So he was very much blind, but he was able to find them. and. It is here where a lot of the, the, you know, the controversies or the questions arise about what exactly happened because he um, rarely spoke about the events over the next 11 days from the time he writes to his mother until he finishes writing the poem on um, 11 days later. He only spoke of it in a, in a political speech 20 years later in 1834 and in a couple letters to uh, members of his family and also to John um, Randolph, who we referenced earlier. So a lot of what we know is um, thanks to, of course, his brother-in-law, Tawny, who many years later in 1859 would give a, a very detailed, detailed account. So some of the questions I know that some attendees had asked me um, previously is, where was Key on the night of the um, bombardment. So he has by this point secured the release of Dr. Beans, but they will not let him go ashore until after Baltimore is taken. And he is going to be about a mile or two behind the British line of battle, about eight miles back from Fort McHenry. So there has been debate amongst his, some historians, was he even capable of of seeing the, the, the fort and seeing that the flag was still there, especially during the battle. Um, you read firsthand accounts from some of these naval battles from the, the 19th century. And the smoke was, was so thick that, you know, in the battle of, of Trafalgar, for example, firing broadsides and you couldn't see anything five feet away. Um, but we do believe that Key did see this. He was far enough back that he would have been able to make out the flag. The other question is, when did Key write this, this poem? So he started scribbling away on a, the back of a letter during the, the battle. And then he finished the poem um, the next day at the Queen's Tavern, Indian 
and Queen Tavern Hotel in Baltimore. And afterwards he gave his, this poem, which he did not actually even name. So it was not called the, the Star Spangled Banner at the time. And he gave it to his brother-in-law, John, or excuse me, Joseph Nicholson, who most likely then gave it to a printer by the name of Benjamin Eads, who started to print these on broadsheets and they began to circulate through the city. And it was around this time it started to appear in newspapers under the name of the Defense of Fort McHenry. And, and he himself is still not yet identified as the author in, in these newspaper articles. He's described as a gentleman from Baltimore who went to see the British uh, fleet on a flag of truce. Um, and then the other great question is, was he writing a poem or a song? And because he rarely discussed it, this is something that a lot of historians have have debated over time. And um, the great historian from Baltimore, Walter Lord, he says that he does believe that he was indeed writing a song to the, the tune of to Anacreon in Heaven, which he had actually used to do um, to the, the, a couple of verses he wrote nine years previously to commemorate the Battle of, of Tripoli. Now, there are some um, accounts that that beg to differ. One was from a journalist named W. U. Hensel, who said, although he was writing in the 1880s, that in the 1830s, Key was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and the band began to play the Star Spangled Banner to, to honor him, and he asked somebody what was the song that was playing. And there are members of his family who also said that he himself was was tone deaf and that it would have been impossible for him to have been writing uh, lyrics with a, with a tune in mind. But of course, this, this is one of the, the great debates that uh, the historians have. And, and he did refer to it in a song in, 18, in 1834 in a speech. And then the last thing that, um, you know, a lot of people have questions about is which flag did he see? Was it the really big Armistead flag that is down at the Smithsonian? And I think uh, down there they do say this was the flag that he that he saw, or was it the smaller storm flag or the, the Pickersgill flag? And uh, most historians from uh, Walter Lord to Mark Leafsom, who was a recent biographer of Key, um, or in agreement that it was the, the, the smaller storm flag because the way the storm was raging, it would have been impossible for the, the, the larger Armistead flag to, to have re remained um, um, sort of flowing in the air as Key was able to see it um, the next morning after, after the battle. So that's just a little background. Of course, there's so much to discuss about Francis Scott Key that hopefully we'll be able to do in, in person later on. Well, we've covered a lot of territory this evening, uh, four personal experiences of members of the uh, founding era, era time. I think that, uh, well, I hope we've provided you with some insights on the themes of democracy in the founding era and how they were um, expressed or articulated uh, locally, uh, especially through the self-government of our local communities and the determination of people to make the experiment of American government work. These experiences demonstrate there was much strife at the time, there was political controversy, but it formed a common bond for the community uh, to work hard to preserve and protect their independence and their form of self-government. And that is how the themes of the founding era played out here locally uh, in small towns in what became Carroll County, as well as uh, small towns throughout our country. So with that, I'll turn the program back over to Dorothy uh, and the Carroll County Public Library. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, everyone. The panel, it, this was just fantastic, so thank you. And I want to invite our uh, guests, our, our audience, if you'd like to uh, type in a question or two, and uh, while you're thinking about that, I want to thank the rest of the uh, planning committee. Uh, Kathleen Brunette from Carroll County Public Schools. She's the supervisor for uh, library media. Uh, 
Val Dennis, who is a media specialist at uh, Manchester Valley High School, and Lynn Myers, who's a media specialist at Francis Scott Key High School. And I think, uh, I think all of them might be on uh, this evening. So thank you for joining us. Um, well, if, uh, let's see, we'll give it just another second here. Here we go. Here's a question. Um, why was Key against the War of 1812 originally? Was this a common view in the US at the time? You need to put on your mic, Jack. Yes, thank you, Eric, for the for the question. Um, so Key, as I said previously, was a, a Federalist. And, and as the, our, the other panelists have also outlined tonight, there's a great division in the United States between uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans, sort of the his disciples who, who come to be president after him. And James Madison was, of course, was, of course, one of them. And it, this was a very popular opinion in the United States, especially in the New England area. There was a, a, a lot of people that were very much against the war. And a lot of people actually referred it to Mr. Madison's war. Um, there were um, sort of communication between even the people in New England and in England itself across the pond. So it was a very common um, view of people in the United States. And one of the things that I didn't really have time to mention is Key's sentiment towards Baltimore. So he actually um, is sort of very critical of the people of Baltimore because people in Baltimore really wanted the war. You know, the, the Times of London described Baltimore as a nest of pirates because of all the privateers that were built here. People celebrated when war was declared. And of course, the people here put up a ferocious fight in the Battle of North Point in defense of, of Fort McHenry. And Key was very worried throughout the night um, of the 13th and 14th of September. He speaks with Cochrane before the bombardment, who says Baltimore has to be taken. It's most likely going to be to be plundered. And you know the the British army they were no saints. The uh, Wellington himself referred to his men as the scum of the earth, and they had been sort of kept in control at, at, in D.C. But after General Robert Ross has been their, their commander has been killed at the Battle of North Point, and Wellington himself was, of course, in Paris. Who was going to be there to um, show the discipline on Baltimore? Baltimore would have really suffered greatly. The British, um, you know, had done sacked many cities in, in Spain, is, like, such as Badajoz and Vitoria during the Peninsular War, and he called it the most merciful deliverance that Baltimore was saved. So during the night when he thinks of the atrocities that could be committed, um, he changes his view of, of Baltimore and all the doubt that he had about the war from the beginning sort of goes away with this great patriotic sentiment that, that he has. If, if I could just uh, build on what Jack said about, about people who opposed the, the, um, the War of 1812. Federalist opposition to the War of 1812, what was so intense that they held a convention at the end of 1814 into 1815 over the war and getting out of the war. And ultimately to many Americans, this meeting which sought, in which they tried, wanted to limit Democratic Republican power, ultimately was the final nail in the coffin of the Federalist Party and their power over the country with the exception of uh, John Marshall. Thank you, Jack and David. And thank you, Eric, for the question. Well, with that, uh, we'd like to thank you once again and um, look for our program uh, sometime later this year. Uh, and uh, thanks again for joining us.